right, we're back at it. We've got time for another uh, video about uh, Susan Epps, uh, Discrete Mathematics. We're going to talk about Section 5.6 today, which is um, which has to do with the method of iteration to uh, determine and perhaps give us a starting point to proving patterns in certain sequences. So the method of iteration uh, follows on what we were talking about last time in Section 5.5 with um, uh, recurrence relations and recursively defined sequences. If you've got one term in a sequence defined in terms of previous ones, so for instance in the Fibonacci sequence where each term was the sum of the previous two terms, that was an example of a recursive uh, recurrence relation that gave us a recursively defined sequence. Sometimes if you're able to start with a given, um, start with sort of the base value for your, uh, your recurrence relation and iterate it several times, that is plug in the formula that gives you the next term and then plug those for, uh, plug those uh, values into the formula that gives you the next term and so forth. Subsequently generating a whole bunch of terms, you start to see a pattern. And hopefully that pattern is one that you can prove either directly or using induction, kind of like we've been doing the last couple sections. So we're going to do just a couple examples to illustrate with the method of iteration. And then I'll indicate a couple of common formulas that show up in a lot of different patterns. We've seen some of them already. So formulas that you should be familiar with. Uh, sort of patterns to be on the lookout for that will help you sort of eyeball um, uh, general formulas for these uh, sequences that are defined recursively. And then we'll, uh, we'll close out with a couple more examples. So, uh, so again, this is talking about uh, the method of iteration. For recurrence relations, recursively defined sequences. Let's take uh, as an example of this application, the sequence that's defined by the following formula. Let's define a sequence A sub n by saying that A0, our starting point for the sequence, is going to be just the value 0. And thereafter, um, each successive term A sub n is just 2 times the previous term. 2 times a sub n minus 1 plus 1 for all n bigger than or equal to 1. So after that starting point of 0, that's our starting point, we double the previous term and add 1. So the method of iteration is really simple. We just go through and we apply the formula. Now at the start, we really have no guess, or we might not, if we're not familiar with this, we have no guess as to what uh, the formula, the closed formula, explicit uh, formula for the terms of the sequence is. What I mean by that, again, is I give you a, a direct explicit formula for a sub n rather than having computed in terms of previous terms. The method of iteration can help us determine what such a pattern might be. So we'll start with our starting point that's given to us, a0 equals 0. And then we'll apply the formula. We'll iterate the sequence a few times. So we take 2 times the previous term, 2 times 0, plus 1. 2 times 1 plus 1 will give us 3. 2 times the previous term, 3 plus 1, will give us 7. 2 times the previous term of 7 plus 1 gives us 15. And we'll just round out with this last iteration, 2 times plus 1 is 31. Now, if you've stared at numbers or patterns or sequences of numbers for any amount of time, you're probably seeing the pattern already in the sequence of 0, 1, 3, 7, 15, 31. Pause for a second, pause the video for a second, see if you can figure out the pattern before I reveal it in just a moment. Notice So we have them all without all that arithmetic intervening. These numbers are not so interesting as the numbers that you get if you add 1 to each term. If I add 1 to 0, I get 1. To 1, I get 2, 4, 8, 16, and so forth. Hopefully you recognize that as a power of 2. In particular, 0 is 2 to the 0 minus 1. 1 is 2 to the 1 minus 1. 3 is 2 squared minus 1. And so forth. In fact, it's a pretty easy formula that we are guessing. 
Thus we guess that a sub n, just from the pattern we've developed here, is going to equal uh, to the n minus one. In fact, that's going to hold. I'm going to guess that that's going to hold for a uh, for n equals zero as well. So for all n greater than or equal to zero, because in fact it did work for zero, this is our guess. We haven't proven that yet. That's just the that's what we get from looking at this pattern. We're going to guess that that's the case. Now uh, we could prove this directly. We could try to prove this directly, but it's been a little while since we've proven something by induction. So let's see if we can prove this by induction instead, making use of this uh, iterative formula here. Our notes down. So remember three parts to an inductive proof. So it's proof by induction. Again, always a good idea to remind your audience that you're using something other than a direct proof technique. So the first case is the base case. When n equals zero, a sub zero is given as zero in our formula. My marker is squeaky today. Our formula gives two to the zero minus one. And of course, we knew this already, but it's not a bad idea just to verify it. Which is one minus one, which is also zero. So the formula holds. So the formula holds. Just to be clear, the way that I got a zero was just from the definition of the sequence. That is the definition of a zero. So the way that a zero is defined agrees with our formula, and we're good. Inductive hypothesis, this is the step in the inductive proof where you don't do any actual work. Assume the formula holds for some fixed and arbitrary value of k. That is that we've shown that our sequence defined in this fashion has the value a sub k equals to the k minus 1. That's what we're assuming. And remember, the trick to induction is to assume it's true for k, and in the next step, the inductive step, to prove that it's true for k plus 1. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'll write down the uh, critical information. Recall that for all n bigger than or equal to 1, a sub n is 2 times the previous term plus 1. And we've assumed inductively that a sub k is 2 to the k minus 1. So we're assuming that's the case. What we want in our inductive step, never a bad idea to start off your inductive step by reminding the reader or the audience what it is you're trying to, to prove. We want a sub k plus 1 to be 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1, right? That is the desired formula that we have replacing k with k plus 1, or, or n with k plus 1, if you, if you recall the way it's stated on the other side. Uh, but note, our recurrence relation. This is where we go back to the definition of the sequence. Our recurrence relation says that a sub k plus 1 is 2 times a sub k plus 1 minus 1, right? 2 times the previous term minus 1. Uh, rather, sorry, plus 1. That's the way the sequence is defined. Well, 2 times a sub, well, k plus 1 minus 1 is just a sub k plus 1, so we can just replace that with a k. And now, by inductive hypothesis, again, never a bad idea to remind your audience where it is you're using the inductive hypothesis. If it turns out that you're not using it, you're probably doing a direct proof in disguise. Using the inductive hypothesis about what we know about a sub k, we can replace a sub k with this quantity here. And now it's just a little bit of algebra and just remembering a basic rule for exponents. Distribute this to 2 times 2 to the k is just multiplying another k, uh, sorry, another 2 into that product. So we have 2 to the k plus 1. Distributing 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. And then we still have that plus 1 sitting out in the back. 
So we get 2 to the k plus 1? Minus 1, which is what we wanted, because that was uh, the formula that we started with, our conjectural formula for the sequence, um, where n was replaced by k plus 1. So we've done it. We, uh, just, to, just to reiterate, <laughs> just to reiterate what we did, we started with a recurrence relation that gave rise to a sequence. We, we iterated a few times using this method of iteration. And that gave rise to this conjectural formula. We looked at these values and we said, well, they look like they're powers of 2 minus 1. So we assumed that, or we, we took that as our, uh, we didn't assume, but we took it as our conjecture. And then we used induction to prove it with the base case, the inductive hypothesis, and then on the back, the inductive step. And stuff is just flying all over the place here because I'm so excited. So that's a good example of the method of iteration. Um, when you do this, certain uh, sequences occur frequently enough that you might want to be on the lookout for them. There's what's called an arithmetic sequence. In this case, the difference between any two terms in the sequence is a fixed amount. And I'm going to check my notes to make sure I'm following the same notation um, as, your, as your textbook. And this would be where a sub n is equal to a sub n minus 1 plus d for some fixed d. I'm kind of getting to the proof here. So some, for some fixed value d. And when you iterate such a sequence, what this gives rise to, if you think about it, a1 would equal a0 plus d, a2 would equal a1 plus d, but that's really a0 plus d adding another d, so that's a0 plus 2d. a3 would end up being a2 plus another d, but you've already got a0 plus 2d there, so that would be a0 plus 3d and so forth. So a sub n ends up equaling a0 plus n times d in this case. So the method of iteration applied to an arithmetic sequence just gives you a nice formula involving the first term adding a number of fixed constants. Another one that comes up quite frequently is a geometric sequence. And in this case, each term is equal to some fixed constant times the previous term. So a sub n is equal to r times a sub n minus 1 for some fixed r. And usually r is used here as the notation because it stands for ratio. That's the common ratio between any term and its previous term. See, if you divided a sub n by a sub n minus 1, you'd have r by itself. And that would be your fixed ratio. In this case, a1 equals r times a0 a2 equals r times a1, but a1 in turn is r times a0. So this is really r squared times a0. And you can probably see the pattern already. If we had a3, for instance, we would have r squared times a0 times another r to get r cubed, and so forth. So in general, our nth term in this sequence is going to be r to the n times a0. So these are a couple of examples that show up pretty frequently. And when you're doing summations, um, when you're doing summations of sequences, uh, let me go ahead and clear a little space here. We've already seen a couple of formulas that will be very, very useful. One, going back I think perhaps even before spring break, was a formula for the sum of, excuse me, I'm walking off camera there. One of them, going back before spring break, was the sum of a geometric series like this. And the other one was the Gaussian summation that I think was from section 5.1, our first section on induction. Um, let me check my notes here. <clears throat> no, I didn't mention in my notes. Um, but the, uh, the Gaussian sum is, 1 plus 2 plus 3, etc., up to some fixed value n. In other words, the sum of the first n integers. So the two formulas I'm referring to here that we've already seen, you might want to remember the Gaussian sum, 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n. 
You can do a simple induction. It was one of our first examples of an inductive proof to prove this formula. And then there's also the geometric ser series related to, um, related to this sort of uh, geometric sequence down here. If you add uh, for some fixed R not equal to uh, 1, the formula you get for this sum is r to the m plus 1 minus 1 over r minus 1. And you can see why r can't equal 1, because if it did, you'd be divided by 0. So this formula works when r is not equal to 1. The nice thing is, if r is equal to 1, you've just got m plus 1 copies of r over here. Uh, 1, rather. Because you'd have 1 plus 1 plus 1 squared, which is also 1, and so forth up to 1 to the n, which is also 1. So note, if r equals 1, this sum, even though the formula doesn't work, uh, the sum is even easier. It's just uh, n plus 1, because you just have n plus 1 copies of 1. All right. Uh, let's just look at one more example here um, to see if we can uh, find uh, a formula. And this one is kind of a, a prelude um, to uh, something we'll talk about, a topic that will round out uh, the semester talking about, and that is uh, complete graphs, uh, and more generally graphs. We're going to talk uh, the last couple weeks of the semester about what graphs are. They're, they're models of networks, essentially, with nodes uh, or vertices and uh, edges connecting those nodes. They can be used to model just about anything that has a discrete ent entity or, or property to it, like, uh, uh, like websites and hyperlinks between them, or cities and highways between them atoms and molecules and the, the uh, interatomic bonds that hold those atoms together inside the molecules. Anytime you've got like objects that are sort of linked to one another, social networks, another example. Um, anytime you have objects that are linked to one another in some fixed fashion, you can generally model it using what's called a graph. So we're going to talk about one very specific kind of graph for a moment here. And again, we'll come back to that in uh, chapter 10, uh, the last week or two of the semester. So the example I want to I give you now is having to do with counting edges in a complete graph. Complete graph. And to be precise, I'm going to talk about a complete graph on n vertices. Excuse me. Vertices in a graph are just the nodes, the, 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 the websites, if you're talking about a collection of websites, the cities on a map connected by highways, the people in a social network. They're the obvious, they're, they're the objects that are connected to one another by, by some means or another. So we're going to look at n vertices. And so I'm just going to draw a few pictures to give you some idea what graphs look like in the abstract. So on one vertex, a complete graph on one vertex is just the vertex itself. The completeness comes in when you're talking about multiple vertices. To be a complete graph on multiple vertices, it must be the case that every edge possible is included. So in some sense, it's complete because every possible edge is there. What I mean by that is if, sh if there are two vertices, they'd better be connected by an edge. So if you have two vertices, a complete graph is really just connecting them with a single edge. Things get a little more interesting when you're talking about three vertices, because then you get one, two, three vertices, one, two, three edges. And you can see we're not, in graph theory, you can talk about adding multiple edges between vertices, and you can talk about adding self-loops that, that begin and end at the same vertex. But for a complete graph, you only include a single edge between any, uh, between any two vertices in a given pair. So on three vertices, you're going to have three edges. Let's do one more, maybe. On four vertices, one, two, three, four. We've got to connect all of these. But then we also have to connect those two across the square. And we have to connect those two. It's OK if our edges cross in our sort of visual representation of a graph. If you pop this into three dimensions, you can see this is kind of like a little tetrahedron. And if you think about it, every single edge, or sorry, every single vertex is connected by an edge 
to the remaining three vertices. So how is it that we can come up with a formula for the number of edges? Just kind of playing around with this a little bit. Can we come up with a formula for the number of edges in a complete graph on a certain number of vertices? And I think we probably can. If we start over here, so coming up with a conjectural formula here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and erase these formulas, although you might want to keep them in mind. I think one of them will be relevant here. <coughs> if we let, let's say, um, let's just so it has, um, um, just, just so, so it sort of suggests, uh, just so it sort of suggests what we're counting, I'm going to use um, E0, uh, not E0, let's call it EN. If EN is the number of edges in a complete graph on N vertices, E0, uh, sorry, not E0, we're starting with one vertex. E1, a single vertex, has no edges. The reason I'm using E is you know, there's an art to choosing notation. You want it to always remind the audience what it is that you're referring to. And I'm using E because E stands for edges, so it reminds us in a way that we're counting edges. EN is the number of edges on a complete graph on N vertices. Our work down here just shows us E1 is equal to 0. And I'm going to record this information, but it turns out that we're probably not going to use it necessarily. E2 is equal to 1. E3 is equal to 3. E4 is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so forth. We can continue. Probably the next couple of uh, complete graphs will be pretty easy to work with. Uh, but I think this is enough to sort of start to demonstrate what's going on here. So switching colors. And I hope this is... This is where, ah, it's blue, cool. This is where my uh, penchant for replacing the, the fillers, um, the, the little cartridges with just any color handy, is coming back to haunt me because I wasn't sure if this really is blue, but it is. All right, got some blue here. So the reason I want to switch colors is because I'm gonna show you that inside of, let's think about this vertex here as the new guy. And inside of this copy of the complete graph on four vertices, there's really a complete graph on three vertices already lurking there. You can almost pretend like if I hide this vertex, that our whole world, to begin with, is a complete graph from the previous step. Adding the new vertex simply adds one, two, three edges between it and each of the existing, the already pre-existing vertices. So again, we start with a graph on three vertices. We, we keep all of its edges because we want to make sure they're all interconnected. And we add a new vertex, which is connected to one, two, three of the previous vertices. Now, that means that our formula for E4 should have been obtainable from our formula for E3 just by adding one, two, three. And if we look at our formulas, that's the case. Three existing edges plus three new ones give us six total. Now, how is this helpful? Because if I want to do five vertices, for instance, I'm not even going to draw an accurate picture of this graph. I'm just going to say, let's say here is our complete graph on four vertices down here. I don't care how many edges are there. All I need to know is that there are four vertices somewhere. I'm going to add my new vertex, and I need to connect it to one, two, three, four existing vertices to get four new edges. I get four new edges. And I had uh, pre-existing edges down here to begin with. How many? Well, we knew we had six in the pre-existing uh, uh, complete graph on four vertices. So what this says is that, uh-oh. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but so you can see the the cap on this marker is black, but the color of the marker itself is blue. I think this is, oh, I see why. <laughs> yeah, okay. But I think this is the blue one, and this is the black one. Ha <laughs> ha, it's Inception all over again. Okay, what was I doing? I was trying to figure, ah, yes, 
I was trying to figure out, and I somehow switched to A here, my apologies, that's supposed to be E4. E5, our argument down here suggests we should have E4 vertices, or edges rather, down here, plus four new edges to get 10. So there's nothing really mysterious going on here. We, we got the previous number that already existed, plus four new ones. Why four? Because there were four vertices we had to connect the new one to. What about E6? E6 should be E5 plus, now we're connecting each of the previous five vertices to the new guy, plus five. And this will give 15. E7 will give us 15 existing, and again, this is E6, 15 existing edges, plus um, six vertices that we have to connect the new guy to, to make 21, and so forth. So what's really going on here? If we unwind the pattern a little further back, we see that we start with zero, we add a single vertex, and connect a, a single new vertex, and we add it to the existing vertices, and then we do it again. We start with, with two vertices and add a new one. So we had one edge plus two new edges connecting the new vertex to the previous ones. And then we had three existing edges and three new ones. And then we had six existing vertices and our edges rather and four new ones and so forth. So at each step, all we're doing, it's not a geometric, or rather an arithmetic sequence where we're adding a fixed amount at each time step. What we're doing is we're adding one more, one additional new edge at each time step. So what's our pattern? Our pattern is E1 is 0, E2 is 0 plus 1, E3 is 0 plus 1 plus 2, E4 is 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, and so forth. So E sub n is going to be what? It's going to be 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. And notice where we stop. If we're looking at E4, we stop at 3. So if we're looking at En, we're going to stop at n minus 1. The nice thing is, if you recall, we already have a formula for this. When, this, when we ended at n, the formula was n times n plus 1 over 2. So when we, when we stop at n minus 1, we're going to get n minus 1 times n minus 1 plus 1 over 2. And this works out to be n minus 1 times n over 2. So that formula that we already computed, that Gaussian sum, came in handy because it gave us a formula right away without having to prove anything. Now, if we didn't have that formula to begin with, we could have re-derived it through induction. So we could have taken this information and uh, gotten this formula uh, by proving, uh, proving this formula by induction rather than just knowing that we had it to begin with. So go back to section, I think it was 5.1, where we proved that formula by induction, if you're, if you're not sure uh, where we did that, or if you're, you're unclear as to where that came from. I think I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, let, me give you a, let me give you a quiz. I want to make sure we do get another quiz in here. Uh, I think I've got enough room down here. So this quiz will be due not this coming Friday, Friday the 3rd, I believe, but Friday the 10th is when this quiz And I've lost track. I think this is, I want to say this is quiz CE4, COVID era four. Um, but check, um, check on Moodle to see that this, that's the right number for this quiz. Uh, so here's the quiz. So let's find the first five terms. So find C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5 if I give you the following formula for them. You're getting C1 for free. C1 is just equal to 1. And CK is equal to 
3 times the previous term, ck minus 1, plus 1 if k is bigger than or equal to 2. And uh, I'll give you a couple points extra credit on the quiz if you can find so extra credit. Guess, you don't even have to prove it, but guess an explicit formula. For CK. So you might have to go a little further than the first five, but if you think you've got a, a conjectural formula that will work, go ahead and see if you can guess what that is. No proof necessary for a couple points extra credit on this quiz. Cool. So thanks for being with me again. I hope this makes sense. As always, feel free to show up to the office hours. Not many folks have shown up yet, but I'm holding office hours from 9 to 10 on Mondays and Wednesdays, and you all should have the Google Hangout um, invitation for that. If you want to meet up with me at another time, please feel free to shoot me an email and we can set it up. Um, and check in with the Math Lab and Stephen Robinson. They're all there to help you. I hope these videos are helping, and I look forward to reading your problem sets in the coming weeks. And uh, um, yeah, just keep in touch with me. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help out. And thank you so much.